Welcome back to the Investing on the Go podcast brought to you by Fund Calibre. Today's episode focuses on the opportunities in European smaller companies with three excellent examples of high quality European companies and why investors should continue to consider European equities in their portfolio. I'm Sam Slater from Fund Calibre. Uh, and today I've been joined by Rosemary Simmons, co-manager of the Bearings Europe Select Trust. Hi, Rosemary. Hi there. Good morning. So perhaps we could start with how European sm- uh, European smaller companies usually fare in a high inflation and a rising interest rate environment. Yeah, of course. I mean, let's be honest, the, the last couple of years has been a, a complete roller coaster for all of us, including investors in European smaller companies. You know, we all had to learn basically a new language, (laughs) not even COVID, furlough, but, you know, the language of pandemic markets, you know, reopening, COVID plays, recovery stocks, lockdown beneficiaries. And just as we thought that we could see the tentative signs of recovery in global economies and markets, we're now, as you say, thinking about interest rates and inflation alongside a whole host of other the attractions to me of European smaller companies over the long term is that these swings and styles and trends in the long term shouldn't matter. And it's the bottom up stock selection that dominates. And, and, you know, back to your question, there are always market commentaries that you can find that will be supportive of your investment case. Um, but for me, you know, European smaller companies is an asset class for the long term. You know, they're, they're companies, smaller companies that will grow faster, be less well covered and ultimately add more value over the longer term. However, History does seem to show that small caps outperform when interest rates rise. And if we look to Japan, where we've seen a challenging low growth environment for some time, small caps have been a good place to be. They've they've outperformed large caps over recent decades. And so when you are looking for growth in a challenging environment, small caps are a pretty safe bet. And as to the point on inflation, for me, I think that comes back to the individual stock selection. You know, the the joy of small caps is that the universe is vast and the individual companies within it are very idiosyncratic. You know, they're very, very focused often on on individual products and services. And so for me, the winners in an inflationary environment are those individual companies that can successfully pass on their inflationary pressures to their customers. So they're those with pricing power, those with a strong competitive advantage, those that are doing things that other companies aren't and doing it better. And this is where bottom-up stock selection should come into its own. And I think identifying those companies that can, in such challenging environments, prosper and prove their worth. And perhaps we could talk about some of those stocks that you hold within the portfolio. Um, I'm just packing up my car ready to go away for the Easter holidays, wondering how I'm going to get everything in. Um, So perhaps I think it's pronounced Tool is a good company to start with. They like racks and things. Quite. Yeah, Tool is a great company for me. You know, it's one that's been in the portfolio for some time. It's clearly been a beneficiary of staycations, you know, a COVID winner, if you like. But for me and for us on the team, it's so much more than than that. You know, this the, this management team inherited a business that, yeah, was very strong in roof boxes, as you mentioned, and bike racks. It had a lot of underperforming businesses, which they divested to focus on the core. You know, they focused on building a brand. You know, I mean, building a brand in roof boxes, it sounds mad. It's such a such a commodity in some senses, but they've built a brand that's centered on outdoor living, it's aspirational. You know, it's it's us wanting to be the kind of person that, you know, has their their bike bike seats on the back of our car that's got their trailers, because we all go out into the outdoors. It's, they've built an aspirational brand. They've focused on the quality of the product and on the profitability of each and every product line. So they've done this really successfully. And they've also added value through M&A to establish really strong other product lines and you know in 2014 they added organically a whole new product line in baby strollers and the exciting thing is it doesn't stop there you know they've announced that this year there's going to be two more product lines and there's loads of speculation as to what they might be um but they're ambitious and confident that the, that each of those product categories can add another 100 million euros in sales in the next five to ten years so for us it's a small business. It's really unique. It's really idiosyncratic, but it's a quality business. It's got a great management team, great franchise, strong balance sheet. They have cash to deploy if they need it. And if they don't, they'll pay it out as a dividend. And the quality credentials drive pricing power. 
and enable them to withstand the challenges of inflation in this environment. And for me, their growth potential is consistently underestimated. And similarly, you know, the valuation. Everyone's assuming that this was a flash in the pan, this is a COVID beneficiary. But actually, I think it's still consistently and, and materially undervalued. And one thing that I haven't mentioned is the ESG credentials. You know, this is this is a business that has, I think it's got a, a, a moral compass. You know, they, they've brought out sustainability targets, but they want them to be science-based. They want them to be able to be checked and audited. You know, they're keen to improve their business. They're keen to make it better. They're keen to make it greener. They're keen to be good to their people. They're keen to have really good governance standards. And it's exactly the kind of company that I like to invest in for our clients. Um, you also hold Ellis, which is all about health, safety and well-being of employees. Is that sort of a, well, it's been a theme that's been strong for, um, in recent years, but perhaps you could tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, of course. And yeah, Elise is a French company. Um, it's an outsourced, it's a provider of outsourced services effectively. So it's involved in the rental and maintenance of professional clothing, of linen for restaurants, hygiene and wellness equipment. Um, and what's really exciting about them is it's, it's a company founded in France over 130 years ago. But now it's a global player. It's in 29 countries. It's in a whole host of sectors. Um, it's a leader in Europe, but it's a strong position in South America. Um, so it's not just washing napkins from French restaurants, but thankfully they've diversified into healthcare. And this was a strong asset during the pandemic. And I think, I think it has been a COVID beneficiary, but not in a flash in the pan sense, in a in a structural sense where the value of its offering, you know, the value of deep cleaning and the value of outsourcing has become much clearer over recent times. Um, and I think it's been very defensive business, you know, in, in a very challenging environment. Their sales declined in 2020 by about 14 percent, but they managed to actually expand their EBITDA margin only modestly, but expand it. And, you know, this is in a world where no one was going to hotels, where no one was eating in restaurants. You know, this is a really impressive achievement. And that kind of thing gives us confidence that in a challenging economic environment, the one you know that looks like we're going to be seeing, a company that is a market leader in, in a loss of its markets, it has pricing power. And that gives confidence in the resilience of its margins through the cycle. So hopefully it benefits from a resurgence in catering and hospitality and tourism. And hopefully the fact that they've been very keen to manage their cost base They'll emerge from the COVID crisis a more profitable business. You know, it's a business that generates cash. It's scalable. It's international. And let's be honest, it's, it helps with the circular economy. It's avoiding using single-use solutions. It's optimizing product sharing. And hopefully it helps clients to reduce their emissions. So there is, a, there is an environmental ESG angle with, with Ellis as well, which... I think isn't always appreciated. So for me, it's a classic quality growth at a reasonable price stock that, that is really attractive for us to invest in for our clients. And the third company I wanted to touch on is Rexel, which is involved in renewable energy amongst other things. Could you tell us more about that? Certainly, yeah. So Rexel, yeah, it's, it's um, one of the global leaders in distributing electrical equipment for professionals within the building sector. Um, and clearly, you know, it should be a beneficiary of a cyclical post-COVID recovery, you know, in building activity and so on. But also, as you point out, a beneficiary of structural trends, you know, supported by demand for renewables, as you say, but also the drive to electrification, the drive for energy efficiency. Um, so but for us, it's, it's been a company that's been brilliantly managed historically management have innovated they've navigated a shift to online pretty expertly you know in many ways right now this business should be in the eye of the storm you know it's a distributor you know in a world where product avail availability is tricky and supply chain ma management is all but impossible and then there's inflation but for me this is where being a high quality distributor is actually a great position to be in you know this isn't their first rodeo, if you like. <laughs> They've navigated volatile pricing environments before. You know, steel goes into a lot of the products they sell. It's very volatile um, input. And their online price allows them 
to make more regular updates to pricing. And the fact that they have diversified suppliers enables greater stock availability. You know, they're not relying on just one supplier and equally, they're not just relying on one customer. So this, from a Porter's Five Forces perspective, you know, they've got a very strong competitive position, which makes it very attractive. Um, but I mean, you, get, you, you pick on a, a really kind of key point in the, you know, addressing the carbon footprint of our buildings. It's one of the largest climate issues that we, we still need to address. And the building sector is a vital part of that, it has a great big role to play. And clearly Europe has strong ambitions to, to address these, these issues. And I think there are a lot of very innovative European smaller companies that are able to play a vital role in these ambitions. Rexel is one of them, but there are a lot of others that are in our portfolio and also some that are that we're looking at just now to learn more about. Um, so, yeah, and, and I think just one other point is that, you know, when you're working in inflationary environment, you often default to companies like brands or, you know, traditionally defensive companies. But I think for me, companies that are distributors, are actually quite an interesting place to be. You know, like companies like Rexel, like INCD, even a company like Amplifon, who work with a range of suppliers who offer a vital service and a really important service. And they get, they have some immunity from inflation because they're passing on pricing directly to their consumers and able to protect their margin in the process. And I think it might be an underappreciated place to invest. One thing I noticed is that each one of them has a really strong ESG characteristic in some way. Now, the fund itself isn't an ESG fund, but how much do you look at ESG aspects when you're picking some of your holdings? Is it really fully integrated or is it just that you think that there are some really good tailwinds behind some of these stories? No, for us, it's it's really important to fully integrate ESG and it has been for, since 2016, I think. We've been integrating our ESG thoughts into how we value, how we value the company through, so that through the the discount rate, the cost of funding that we apply, but also how we assess the quality of a business. And I think that's not that's not really that innovative anymore, but it maybe was back then. But for me, I think one ESG can be a really powerful growth driver because we've got so much opportunity out there in in making companies greener, better, more socially aware. Um, but also it really is part and parcel of, of the quality of a business nowadays. I mean, we're all, we're all pretty well versed in the great resignation. For example, you know, treating your employees well, having a business and that's doing something that your employees can be proud of is fundamental <laughs> to your competitive advantage now. Because in so often we see that the competitive advantage lies with the people, The people need to be bought into a business. So that's just one element of where we need to try and get a sense of that when we're investing in companies. You know, why would people want to work with you? Why would customers want to buy your products? That makes you, you know, a better company if you're doing something worthwhile. So for us, it's certainly the case that ESG is embedded. It's certainly the case that we think that is that is the right thing to do, both in terms of, analyzing companies and, and for society. And yeah, I think I think it's the only way to invest nowadays is to embed ESG in your research. Because if you don't, you're missing key risks, but also key opportunities that are out there for the businesses that you're looking at. And finally, perhaps you could just give us a few pointers as to why you think investors should consider European smaller companies at the moment. What would be their biggest attraction? Yes, yeah, sure. Well, I mean, sadly, it's, it's very clear that Europe's facing some pretty serious geopolitical challenges at the moment. Um, but I think if we can if we can take a bit of a more positive look on Europe and smaller companies, there is an argument that they're also pretty powerful growth drivers. You know, we've touched on, you know, green issues, the green deal, um, renewables, electrification, also, you know, deglobalization, you know, might make us a bit sad, but also it's driving more onshoring. You know, maybe worries about supply chains are going to force more investment within Europe. And smaller companies may well be a particular beneficiary from some of these. And I think the other thing that upsets me a bit and is often overlooked is that Europe's actually quite good at a lot of things. <laughs> you know, I've mentioned building materials, but look at healthcare. 
Look at the testing companies that we're all, all too familiar with. Europe was really innovative and really pioneering in this space. Look at luxury goods, you know, something we haven't really talked about all that much recently. Look at renewables companies. So I think Europe is, is often underappreciated and as such is a pretty ripe hunting ground for stock pickers. And I think that's true of Europe and it's also true of small caps. And so small caps, you know, I'm, We've talked about it a lot my entire career about the structural tailwinds of small caps and I don't think they've disappeared you know small caps tend to grow faster they're more beneficiaries when it comes to M&A and also they tend to be less well covered by fewer people and for me valuations right now it's I mean it's a movable feast obviously but they look pretty reasonable certainly relative to large caps relative to other asset classes in particular for the growth that they offer and so for me, I think over the longer term, small caps are a very attractive area for investing. Um, there might be a lot of noise in the short term, unfortunately. But I think over the long term, bottom up, company specific attractions should shine through and be the main drivers of performance. And, and this is when it's a really exciting time to be invested in European smaller companies. That was really informative. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. The Barings Europe Select Trust invests in small and medium-sized companies and is run on growth at a reasonable price basis. The team is looking at both the growth and quality aspects of a company, as well as an integrated approach to ESG, as Rosemary demonstrated in this episode. To learn more about the Barings Europe Select Trust, visit fundcaliber.com. And don't forget to subscribe to the Investing on the Go podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts. Please remember we've been discussing individual companies to bring investing to life for you. It's not a recommendation to buy or sell. The fund may or may not still hold these companies at the time of listening. Elite ratings are based on Fund Caliber's research methodology and are the opinion of Fund Caliber's research team only. 